We are back. I know you've missed our trips into the world of questionable, mysterious, and downright deranged music. And today, it's about time we look at albums. The projects on this borderline endless list are worth getting lost in, so this is going to be a double feature. We will focus on the first years of our journey tonight so we can make sure to explore each and every one. I promise, part two will be worth the wait. Now, get comfortable, dim those lights, and get ready to descend down the center of the earth through the disturbing album's iceberg. Tears are arbitrary and thematic, and constructive criticism is more than welcome. Level 1 On the Record This tier features famous albums that you probably already know and that are widely respected but have a darker edge to them. The Wall is one of the best selling concept albums of all time. The rock opera tells the story of Pink, a depressed musician who isolates himself, gradually building a wall around him. Pink is based on Sid Barrett, a former member of Pink Floyd who had a nervous breakdown and left the band, and also on chief songwriter Roger Waters, whose father also died during World War II. A feature film was produced in 1982, with the screenplay written by Waters himself. It was also adapted into an actual opera in 2016. Hatful of Hollow is a compilation album made up of several BBC Radio 1 recording sessions in 1983, comprised of alternate versions of the Smiths' singles at the time. While it was released after the band's debut album, the songs were actually recorded at the same time, but with different production. Because of this, a lot of them sound rougher, with slower rhythms and more pronounced instrumentation that sounds more brooding and melancholic. Lead singer Morrissey's more subdued vocals and abrasive existential lyrics are subject to mixed reception, but make the record bluntly incisive to this day. The Cure's fourth album, Pornography, is now a hallmark of goth rock which was not that popular at the time of its release. Exhausted by touring and the demands of full musicianship, frontman Robert Smith became depressed and used the record as an outlet, along with drugs and alcohol. The band slept in the record studio's office at the time to save money while recording. They wanted to make the ultimate intense album, which ended up costing members relationships and mental stability. It was the last album to feature the group's trademark goth sound before they shifted in a more commercial direction. Unknown Pleasure was Joy Division's debut album and the only one to be released while lead singer Ian Curtis was still alive. While the band was notorious for their loud, high-energy live performances and Curtis's dancing, producer Martin Hennett used the songs to experiment with more unconventional sounds like backwards guitars, someone eating chips, a bottle being smashed, and a speaker inside an elevator. The result was a gloomier album known for its spacious sound that divided band members in terms of original reception. While it wasn't extremely well received at first, the album has since become an icon of post-punk culture, and its cover which is a stacked plot of the radio emissions of a pulsar star, has transcended the music scene and made its way into the mainstream. Black Star is David Bowie's last album, recorded in secret and meant to coincide with his 69th birthday. It was a swan song of all sorts, a parting gift for fans which became a charting success in the UK and number one for three weeks after release. Lyrics appear to foretell his impending death, especially the song Lazarus, which references Look Up Here, I'm in Heaven and I'm Dying Too in the track Dollar Days. It was more experimental in sound than Bowie's last record, The Next Day, and this time around he was inspired by Kendrick Lamar's To Pimp a Butterfly, as well as the work of Death Grips and Boards of Canada, avoiding straightforward rock and roll. Bowie died two days after it was released from liver cancer, shocking the public, from which he had kept his diagnosis a secret. 
One of Bowie's inspirations was Death Grips' debut mixtape self-released for free on their website in 2011, Ex Military. The tape was instantly notorious for its loud, blaring, distorted industrial samples and overdubbed, half-shouted vocals, courtesy of MC Ride, whose raw anger created a grimy and intense, in-your-face atmosphere for the rest of the tracks. The album begins with a Charles Manson sample, and some speculate its story tells an overarching tale about a Vietnam War veteran struggling with PTSD. In fact, the picture on the cover, which was a symbol of power one of the members held onto for 10 years in his wallet, was later identified to have been taken in 1968. For Radiohead, Kid A, their fourth album, was a sonic departure from the rock-oriented global success of OK Computer. As a response to the stress caused by the band's success, the album was actually not promoted and instead offered in streaming platforms and later leaked online. Only one interview was made before its release with Q Magazine, with the band providing bizarre edited photos to be published that they then plastered and projected across the city streets on billboards. Radiohead performed in a tent to promote it. The music was also more experimental, with free jazz and electronica and dark ambient influences, which was a career risk of all sorts. The Holy Bible was the third Manic Street Preachers album recorded before the disappearance of Richie Edwards, the rhythm guitarist who was drinking heavily at the time and struggled with depression, self-harm, and anorexia. He would fall asleep during recording sessions, which he'd begin by fixing himself a drink. The themes of suffering are reflected on the album, which contains essayistic musings that are often politically charged reflections on consumerism, imperialism, freedom of speech, violence, capital punishment, and revolution. Some of the song titles, which you now see on screen, already set the tone for the content of the album and are complemented by dialogue samples. The music on it is also more overtly inspired by post-punk and goth rock, as opposed to modern hard rock like the previous albums by the band. Alice in Chains' third EP, Jar of Flies, was also the first EP to ever debut in the Billboard 200 chart. The album was mostly made up of improvised songs written during the band's previous years of touring and came to exist after they had moved into the London Bridge studio in Seattle after getting evicted and going homeless. The members wanted to test their chemistry with their new bass player, Mike Inez, and so began recording acoustic songs as a means to do so, and inspired by the loud electric sounds they'd been working with for a year during tours. The title is a reference to an experiment that guitarist Jerry Cantrell conducted in the third grade, where he compared underfeeding and overfeeding two separate jars of flies, and found that the underfed ones were more likely to survive. This bleak realization drives an equally bleak record that largely celebrates loneliness and isolation. Sonic Youth's first album, Confusion is Sex, was recorded in their sound engineer's basement and released in 1983. It has since become one of the most notorious no-wave albums of all time. Largely atonal, dissonant, without a unifying tempo, abrasive, angular, with buzzing guitars, and strong tribal drumming. Lyrics veer on misanthropic laments, and one of the songs, The World Looks Red, was written by Swan's frontman Michael Jira. The Downward Spiral, no, not that one this time, is the second Nine Inch Nails album with more industrial, techno, and metal influences focusing on texture and space. It was recorded at Sharon Tate's mansion where she had been murdered by Charles Manson. It was a concept album detailing the psychological downfall of a man ending with a suicide. And it was inspired by frontman Trent Reznor's state at the time as he struggled with drug addiction and stormy relationships with his bandmates. Too Dark Park was the sixth album by Skinny Puppy. The band wanted to veer away from the ministry-inspired industrial metal sound of their previous album, so they revamped their art style, logo, and overall aesthetic that was more chaotic and electronic. The title was a reference on the music becoming really dark, like the feeling of going down a road with the knowledge that you're breaking down, yet you continue to travel down that road. Themes include environmental degradation and self-destruction of humanity as well as drugs. Vocalist Nevik Ogre was arrested for possession during the recording, in fact. It samples horror films, TV shows, and documentaries, but with more haunting, threatening samples. After signing onto a new major label, Lava Records, Porcupine Tree wished to shift from their previous psychedelic and rock directions. The result was In Absentia. Fretman Stephen Wilson had recently rediscovered metal and was inspired by bands like Burzum and Opeth. The songs in the album reflect Wilson's interest in exploring the psychology of unhinged, twisted criminals, 
with lyrics referring to serial killers, loss of innocence, and modern-day injustice. The title means in absence in Latin, a phrase which is used to refer to a person's rights when mentally unable to be represented in legal situations. Tool's first album, Undertow, helped reinstate the importance of metal music in the mainstream 90s and earned critical respect and acclaim for the band. It was largely inspired by controversial comedian Bill Hicks. The song Disgustipated is the result of a sledgehammer being smashed into two secondhand pianos. Original art included nudes which Kmart and Walmart refused to sell, leading to the band having to create a censored version specifically for retail. However, a secret, somewhat satirical image of a cow can still be seen in the CD tray. Rapper Eminem's third record blended a more introspective lyrical perspective with satire and horrorcore elements pondering fame and his subsequent alienation from his family. It was wildly controversial upon its release because of its insensitive lyrics and references to Columbine. It was used as evidence to attempt to deny Eminem entry into Canada. It was a commercial and critical success, however, and it is considered Eminem's best album with an everlasting influence in pop culture. In particular, the song Stan, which samples Dido's Thank You, tells the story of an eager fan who writes to his favorite rapper, detailing the struggles of his daily life, and upon not receiving a response, drives his car with his pregnant girlfriend tied up in the trunk off of the highway. It has recently re-entered the mainstream, becoming synonymous with overzealous, obsessive fandoms. Pork Soda was the third Prima Studio album that was significantly darker in tone than their previous efforts. Lyrical themes included murder and alienation, but the band insisted that they were not inspired by their personal lives and that their mood at the time was actually positive and happy, contrary to most artists on this list. The title track was later omitted from the lyrical booklet of the album, remaining a mystery consisting of what was at the time unintelligible rambling. Trout Mask Replica was the third studio album by Captain Beefheart and his magic band, which combined R&B with garage rock, blues, and free jazz for a distinctly avant-garde, polarizing result. The album was produced by Frank Zappa and featured Captain Beefheart, aka Don Van Vlee, on a number of woodwind instruments like the saxophone, musette, and natural horn. Vocals are more akin to rambled narrations, and the occasional input of the band was recorded in a single six-hour session, remaining unsynced as a result. Despite Despite the members' lack of proficiency on instruments, remaining an urban legend that has since been disproven. While a commercial failure at the time, the album has been re-evaluated in subsequent years, now recognized as an innovative musical achievement. Level 2, The B-Sides. This tier features conceptual, lesser-known albums that music aficionados like, but most mainstream-adjacent only fans wouldn't know about. Themes are often dark and bleak, but the style of the resulting music remains somewhat accessible. Tyler, the Creator's debut album slash mixtape was released on Christmas 2009. In it, he raps as a character who is speaking to his therapist and guidance counselor, Dr. TC. This framing device helps him explore misanthropic feelings in his lyrics, with references to violence against retaliating women and hatred of mental illness. The album's explicit bars, which reference race, sexuality, and sexism, led to a then-UK Home Secretary Theresa May to impose a ban on Tyler's entrance to the country, which was only lifted in 2019. Some Rap Songs was the third studio album by Earl sweatshirt, which features vocal samples from personal figures in Earl's life, like his mother, UCLA professor Cheryl Harris, and his father, known by his pen name Brow Willie, a South African poet and political activist, who passed away before the record was completed. The album is a dark, deep dive into Earl Sweatshirt's mind state following the death of his father with his baritone monotone rap buried and interrupted by thick and chaotic samples. Songs are short, accompanied by psychedelic lo-fi nostalgic and uncommon time signatures and beats, which let listeners get lost as what starts as a breezy listen turns into a claustrophobic nightmare. Machine Girl is the first album of Matt Stevenson's project as Wolf Girl. It made an impact because of its fascinating and enchanting futuristic sonicscape. The drums are fast and booming, the song composition is jagged and rough, making the most intense moments hit hard and completely overwhelming in their glitchy heaviness. The album's defined aesthetic and sample choice coming from Japanese anime and video games gave it a distinct adrenaline-fueled feminine energy that created a unique sense of atmosphere, with a mystic and dreamy aura that made it an instant success on the internet. 
Unflash is the second Gazelle Twin album, the project of Elizabeth Bernholz. It has a more aggressive and simplified sound than its predecessor, with more lo-fi spoken word structures that heighten lyrical importance. Some themes discussed include miscarriage, colonization, upbringing, body dysmorphia, and euthanasia. The sound, which features skittering beats and distorted warped vocals, was inspired by Elizabeth's two-year studies of medicine. Habermensch, which means half-person, is Einstein's and New Button's third album. It quickly became a staple of German industrial music because of its pulsating beats and harsh vocal delivery, which is complemented by the guttural nature of the German language that I probably just mispronounced. The entire title track, a cappella, was performed with guest vocalists, redefining the range of industrial and electronic music in Germany at the time. The group's vocalist and guitarist, Blixa Bargeld, who also worked with post-punk band The Birthday Party and Nick Cave, delivered vocals that were anywhere in between labored whispers and downright screams. The result is danceable, albeit horrifyingly disfigured synth-pop, focusing on rhythm with dissonant and ominous harmonies. Francis the Mute was the second Mars Volta album. Allegedly, the late sound technician of the band, Jeremy Ward, discovered a diary in the backseat of a car he'd repossessed and realized it told the story of a man who'd been adopted in search for his parents. Ward had been adopted himself and began annotating the similarities between his life and that of the author, which became the main inspiration behind the album. Each track title, in fact, was inspired by a person who was mentioned in the diary. The lyrics deliver most of the horror, as they were mostly improvised and inspired by the visuals on a stack of TVs that guitarist Oma Rodriguez Lopez owned and displayed in his apartment, and that vocalist Cedric Bixler Zavala would look at while recording, citing anything from The Magnificent Seven to Akira Kurosawa as an inspiration. The sound of progressive rock was interlaced with ambient music concrete interludes, including the sound of Koki frogs and what appears to be a woman being essayed. F Sharp A Sharp Infinity is the debut studio album by Godspeed You Black Emperor. It was named after the secret track recorded on the vinyl's locked groove, an area where the needle drifts to when a record is finished playing to avoid it scratching the label. The vinyl is different from the CD, which was re-recorded to be released in Chicago's cranky label instead of the vinyl's original word-of-mouth DIY distribution in Canada. It features an apocalyptic feel, incorporating melodic outbursts in endless seas of atmospheric soundscapes. The CD version switches between various sections more abruptly, with recording progressions being reorganized, songs increasing from 2 to 3, and runtime almost doubling. Director Danny Boyle claimed that he was inspired by the album when cutting his film 28 Days Later. Leaves Turn Inside You is the eighth and final Unwound album, a double album recorded in their own studio. Like their previous two albums, it uses the mellotron and subdued instrumentation, which give it a distinctly retro and psychedelic twist to their more traditional punk sound. Vocals range from delicate whispers to shrieks and shouts, reminiscent of the band's hardcore punk roots. It begins with two minutes of static guitar drones, setting a sinister apocalyptic atmosphere and ominous instrumentation, with lyrics that are nihilistic and void of any hope, making for a sad, introspective, emotional, scary, and slightly unnerving listen. Death Consciousness is the debut album by Have a Nice Life, one of Dan Bure's projects. The album was largely written and composed off of scraps and bits of songs that had been written and recorded by the band members, which came together after Bayre's father passed away. The album's recording budget was less than $1,000 and it was mostly recorded using Dan's computer mic. A 70-page booklet was released alongside it, which includes paintings and lyrics, something Dan Bayre would go on to do with his other releases. The album features a strong undercurrent of lo-fi darkness bordering on flirtation with nihilism. It is drenched in reverb and buried under lay of feedback latent guitars. While the mood and themes remain gloomy and bleak, the atmosphere is strangely warm and soothing, songs ranging from quiet drowsy ambient sounds to shoegazy layers. While not exactly popular when it was released, it was nonetheless well received and has since achieved a cult following. Dancing is Depressing is the second album by Attic Basement. It was a concept album about a depressed man who is at the end of his rope. In 2009, Mike Reinheimer, who wrote and recorded the album himself, had an okay job, but he wasn't happy, a sentiment that informs the album, which features plain spoken and complex songs. Audible anxious sighs and guttural noises emphasize the nature of the record, focused on internalized tensions spilling out on tape. Lyrics are delivered in a monotonous, helpless daze, cataloging feelings of hopelessness and addiction as an escape. 
It ends on a seven minute track where the narrator goes on a rogue rampage, turning wallowing self-loathing into borderline psychopathic ramblings, showing that anyone can succumb to apathy and become mentally unstable. Even you. I Could Live in Hope is the debut studio album by Lowe, a reaction to loud 90s grunge favoring slower compositions and sparse and minimalistic instrumentation. The band had recently been discovered and produced by Mark Kramer, who had worked with another slowcore band, Galaxy 500, as well as a number of New York downtown bands. The music is sparse and skeletal, guitars performing solos using only a handful of notes, and the drums only resorting to brushed ride and snare. The atmosphere is bleak and melancholic, with cold, devastating vocals that create a new emotionally draining, hopeless sound that nonetheless remains oddly peaceful and ethereal despite the unmitigated sadness it exudes. The album was recognized as a seminal release in the emergence of slow, dreary rock music. Hospice is the Antlers' third album which sees them go in a full band recording direction as opposed to Peter Silberman's solo project. It's a concept album which uses the buddying love story between a hospice care worker, which many speculate to be Silberman himself, and a female terminal patient who suffers from bone cancer. The woman's traumas, fears, and disease are used to explore the deeper meaning of an abusive relationship. The connection explored is one that is oblivious to the outside world, intimated by impending fatality, and riddled by the pain of loss, disconnection, and desertion through sparse crescendos and sprawling melodies. Another album openly inspired by death is the 8th Mount Erie album, A Crow Looked at Me, the solo project of Phil Elvram, who is also the man behind the microphones. It is a raw and intimate collection of reflections dealing with the diagnosis and subsequent rapid death of his late wife, musician Genevieve Castre, who had just given birth to the couple's daughter before passing. Lyrics are simple and blunt, attempting to avoid finding meaning in philosophizing the mourning and loss and simply stating it is not something to make into art or to sing about. The album was recorded in the same room where Castre died, where Elvram had left a window open for several days, allowing nature to overtake and dilute the bleak atmosphere. He used several of her instruments for the first time completing the record digitally instead of using analog studio equipment. Elvrim continued exploring his relationship with grief and Castray's death in the next two Mount Erie albums, Now Only and Lost Wisdom Part 2, with more melodic and less sparse sounds. Discussed in our shock artist iceberg, Everywhere at the End of Time is the 11th record of Leyland Kirby as the caretaker. It was gradually released following the success of An Empty Bliss Beyond This World in 2011 over the course of a three-year period, which was supposed to mimic the passage of time. Each album in the series represents a stage of dementia, with ballroom music snippets simulating memories being corroded into loud, ambient, and experimental sound collages. This album has gained a cult following and has been discussed at large by a number of brilliant creators, with even an entire iceberg video dedicated to it alone. The Disintegration Loops was another series of albums released gradually between 2002 and 2003, consisting of deteriorating tape loops. William Bezinski had attempted to transfer his tape recordings from the 1980s into digital format, but had discovered the sound quality degraded every time they passed the tape head. He allowed them to play for extended periods to heighten the effect treating it with spatial reverb. The entirety of the project was completed on the morning of the September 11 attacks, which Bezinski saw from his Brooklyn apartment and immortalized in the cover of the records. He said, The events gave new meaning to the musical pieces created by catastrophic decay in his studio a few weeks before. Bazinski played the entirety of the tapes at the MoMA Museum in New York City for the 10th anniversary of the attacks in 2011. Dope Throne is the third album by stoner metal band Electric Wizard. The recording process was influenced by the band members' alcohol and drug addictions at the time, who lived at the studio and would use and drink before beginning to record. They wished to make a record that was going to be the most disgusting, foul, putrid thing that anyone had ever recorded. Riffs are painfully slow, thick and heavy, drowning listeners in the depths of marquee fuzz, with even vocals sounding like they're buried underneath a thick fog, the repetitive structure of the album creating a dense, hypnotic atmosphere. The occult-themed lyrics are coupled with several samples from horror, fantasy, and witch movies. Monoliths and Dimensions is the sixth album by Sun. It was the band's most ambitious project at the time, which was recorded over a period of two years and featured a number of musical collaborations, amongst which guitarists, vocalists, trombonists, and a number of other string and brass musicians. The end result, however, doesn't incorporate the natural instruments within the drone sounds, but rather blends the two through feedback, creating a complex, multifaceted timbre with detailed arrangements and jarring compositions, giving the record a vaguely religious, 
yet ominous, ritualistic feel. Hallmark 87 says about Atrium, Glass elevators zoom up and down, silently passing each other. The light pouring through the ceiling inspires you. The music echoing through all 47 floors sounds of wonder and new discoveries. Yet the concrete walls make you feel cold and small. You can't help but get the feeling that you're totally alone. This is brutalism, and this is the hotel of the modern age. The sound of Atrium is an isolated take on Mallsoft, a vaporwave subgenre, contoured by never-ending echoes, ringed-out store jingles, clocks chiming, and other banal yet flowery passages that showcase the systematic doom of the setting. The album is dedicated to John C. Portman Jr., a new futuristic architect and a real estate developer who was widely known for popularizing hotel lobbies with much lauded ample atrias revered by vaporwave aesthetics. My Teenage Dream Ended is Farrah Abraham's debut album, who was famous at the time for her appearance in MTV's reality show, 16 and Pregnant, and its sequel, Teen Mom. The album was made after Abraham reached out to an engineer in the hopes of producing a record inspired by Benny Benassi's song, Cinema. She then recorded the vocal tracks by herself on a click track without hearing the music, with its production being handled separately. Her vocals were then given an edgy autotune treatment, which she requested because it was in vogue at the time. Each track is named after a chapter in the accompanying autobiography that details Abraham's life at the time, dealing with motherhood, fame, and the death of her daughter's father. While the mainstream failed to understand what Abraham had perhaps accidentally put together, music critics praised the album's conceptual high art atmosphere, likening it to works of outsider music, which coupled messy electronica with personal lyrics and arrhythmic and cheaply digitized presentation. Another unsettling electronic record is Cat System Corp's conceptual broken transmission album about the September 11 attacks, News at 11. It is designed to have two sides. Side A has nine tracks, which compile commercial snippets and other bits of broadcasts from September 11, right before the attacks. One of the most recognizable samples is perhaps a McDonald's ad that was last played before the 9-11 coverage began on NBC. Complete with the Today Show's intro interrupting it, Side B then begins with 11 tracks that are all titled Weather Channel, imagining a future in which perhaps the event has never occurred, or a mere temporal reality before the discovery of the dramatic occurrence, sampling weather reports mixed with smooth jazz bits. The end result is soothing and haunting, a eulogy to a future that never truly existed by transforming it into an alternate past. Level 3, Bonus Tracks this tier features albums that are openly non-commercial and don't tend to be entry-level listens with experimental edges that challenge most fans. Shaking the Habitual is The Knife's final and potentially least accessible album. It makes a variety of philosophical and political statements being inspired by feminist and queer theory and the title coming from a Michel Foucault quote. The duo criticized nuclear families and capitalism during interviews and commissioned a Swedish illustrator to design a comic book title and extreme wealth, feeling at odds with the commercialization of the music scene and its inherent conflict with artistic ethos. The music also made overt references to works by Margaret Atwood, Jeanette Winterson, and Nina Bjork. Despite its critical acclaim, the album was largely recognized as a difficult listen and hard to appreciate because of its length and dissonance with eerie electronic beats that are strange, disturbing, and sometimes uncomfortable. These electro-prog tracks are often interluded with dark ambient segments that are more than 20 minutes long, featuring distorted and downright demonic vocal delivery. The album was the last one completed by the duo made up of siblings Karen and Olaf Dreyer before they disbanded in 2014. Deconstructionist was the second Giles Corey release, an event folk project by Dan Boré of Have a Nice Life. It is made up of over an hour of music designed to induce trances, possession states, and out-of-body experiences. Not a record, but a philosophical tool. It was accompanied by a 30-page booklet, in typical Barré fashion, exploring the why and how and history of trance, the illusion of the self, and why some people take their lives and have their consciousness shaped by light and sound. The album must be listened to through headphones, as various frequent are utilized similar to binaural beats, which affect brain functioning. Those with epilepsy or a history of mental illness are warned by Beret to speak to a doctor before listening to this album, as some of the recording techniques are said to cause seizures. 
Seven Idiots is the eighth album by Katsuhiko Maeda as Project Worlds and Girlfriend, the founder of the record label Virgin Babylon Records. Seven Idiots is a backwards journey through Dante's Divine Comedy that starts with heaven, then purgatory, and ends in hell. The descent from pure joy to absolute terror is vivid, beginning with loud guitars, building, adding in drum and bass, electronics, and strings to the mix. The track Bohemian Purgatory is where we start the descent, with melancholic hunting pianos, saxophones, polyrhythms, and an array of unique sounds. World's End Girlfriend's representation of hell is also sample-based, but clutters itself with sounds of talking and screaming amidst distortions. The album achieved moderate success, despite the heavy abrasion of the latter half alienating most fans who enjoyed its idyllic beginning. Hush Wave is the second Begotten album. It uses exclusively female vocal samples to paint a haunting and creepy effect that is also somewhat soothing despite still standing ghost-like and atmospheric. A poem was included with the release, along with a chillingly telling quote, wish I could write songs about anything other than death. The label which released it details a deranged story on its Bandcamp page by which a mysterious uploader who has contacted Begotten numerous times in the past finally gets a response after the release of Hushwave. This response being a letter coming from an address in Georgia which led back to a mental institution and another envelope simply proclaiming you were invited, this time from an Azerbaijani address that led to a graveyard. Despite the strange story and haunting samples of spooky, scary skeletons, the album has been mostly debunked as an internet ARG with a strong, enchanting concept. Aphex Twin's third album, I Care Because You Do, is the first after his ambient compilations, which reintroduces a more rhythmic and percussive beat. The album was polarizing upon its release because of its stark contrast between Aphex's ambient soundscapes with experimental, heavy breakbeats. The grinning self-portrait on the cover, an unsettling depiction of a familiar expression, hints at the jarring contrast to be found in the sounds of the record. The end result was comforting and scary at the same time, navigating influences that verged from trance to hip hop and experimental post-classicism in the vein of Philip Glass. Excavation is the second Hacks and Cloak album. The sleeve already tells us all we need to know about it. A dark, surreal journey into an unknown eldritch chamber, where vision is non-existent and only sound guides you. The use of echo and reverb perfectly complements the metallic, skittering, thudding booms and twinkling synths in the production. Juxtapositions of screams and silence make it sound like the score of a horror film, creating an excellent, paranoid atmosphere. Another horror-heavy record is the fourth clipping album, and the second half of the horror-themed project started with the previous album There Existed an Addiction to Blood, originally recorded at the same time but too lengthy to fit in one release. Visions of Bodies Being Burned is filled with horror samples from slasher films and heavily inspired by horror writers, with lyrics addressing listeners directly in second person or telling scary stories in third. Despite having a tight specific concept, producer Jonathan Stripes aimed to create a record that was and just conceptual, with heavy production that was relevant to its themes, bordering on distortion, with influences from both modern industrial, noise, and power electronics. Some of the tracks contained in the field recording portions were recorded at actual murder sites, like Lamont Park, where Elizabeth Short, also known as the Black Dahlia, had been murdered. The album also contains references to racial justice movements, sampling George Floyd as Big Floyd and dedicating a track to the protests that surged after his killing. two-bedroom house in Georgia on an old Ampex 8-track machine. While this helped the band expand their creativity in limited production costs, it also encouraged band members to indulge in drug use during recording. This resulted in a bizarre brand of punk, heavy metal, and psychedelic music as well as world music beats and more noise-centric moments. This varied array of sampling created a frenzied, chaotic, and nightmarish atmosphere, leading many to describe it as a bad acid trip. Complete with fever dream tropes like animal noise tracks, a group of cows moving outside a slaughterhouse in a song that addresses the aftermath of a woman's experience with S.A. The cover has become an icon that makes the album instantly recognizable, a depiction of Arthur Cernoff's Fido and the Clowns, which reminded many of John Wayne Gacy, a serial killer who also worked as a clown. Spiderland is the second and last album made by Slint. It was recorded over the course of four days, 
While Slint were still an improvised band of former childhood friends experimenting with music in Louisville, the fantastic documentary Breadcrumb Trail does an excellent job at retelling the story behind Spiderland and the band's formation and subsequent dissolution. And it's on YouTube. The album was virtually obscure at the time, but built a cult following as time went on, becoming one of the most influential post-rock albums and an incisive release in the origin of math rock, known for its irregular time signatures and dynamic tempo shifts. Vocals alternate from spoken word narratives to hushed tones and even shouting, and while their disturbing narrative is often one of the most memorable elements of Slint's music, lyrics were actually written on the spot by Brad McMahon during the recording. You Won't Get What You Want is the fourth Daughters album and the first album in nine years from the band, which had disbanded in 2009. It saw a shift in sound from the grindcore and mathcore to industrial and noise rock, with the emphasis shifting from noise and abrasion to clear vocals and complexity. The record is a deconstruction of tension, emphasized by hypnotic dissonance, martial drums cranked to incapacitating volumes, and scathing repetition, which emphasizes the loss of all hope, love, and human connection. Lightning Bolt's third album, Wonderful Rainbow, is considered their most notorious and accessible, but they are an odd band. The duo is made up of a drummer, who is also the vocalist who sings holding the microphone in his mouth, and a bassist who plays with a five-string bass that has two actual banjo strings and is tuned to cello tuning. The songs are fast, rough, noisy, possibly headache-inducing in what is a challenging listening experience overall. But while the album is extremely loud and fast, it isn't bleak, with many describing it as the sound of raw, unfiltered energy. Rain Dogs is the ninth Tom Waits album. It merges a number of styles, including blues, opera, and jazz into one singular loose concept album about urban, downtown New York City, as inspired by the 1984 documentary Streetwise, which takes place in Seattle and documents the lives of homeless youth. It includes field recordings of the city and was recorded in Lower Manhattan. Waits was very adamant about the record being organic, making it all the more impressive that it still features marimbas, accordions, double basses, and trombones. He would give featured session musicians the songs before they'd come into the studio, letting them improvise and build upon his ideas and refusing any kind of studio editing, favoring repeated takes until the sound was right. Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones plays on the album, but Waits' gravelly voice is probably the most recognizable element, emphasizing the gritty street atmosphere of back-alley bizarre rock and roll. Nico's second solo album, The Marble Index, was a radical departure from the folksy Chelsea Girl, which saw her turning into the avant-garde acoustic drone world of John Cale's musical arrangements. During the making of the record, Nico was inspired by a desire to radically alter her image and gain artistic recognition beyond her fame as a model, dyeing her hair and turning to medieval folk music as a major influence. After spending a summer reading poetry and experimenting with peyote with Jim Morrison, Nico was inspired to make her own music on a harmonium, an instrument that was out of tune with virtually anything. She was able to secure a record deal and produce the album with Kale, consuming heavy amounts of heroin during the process, crafting ethereally darker ambience and disturbing sonority. The album went on to become a massive influence on goth music, anticipating its gloomy and doomy dissonance. The debut self-titled studio album by the Mr. Bungle Band mixes a variety of musical styles including ska, circus music, heavy metal, free jazz, and funk, sometimes all in the same track, resulting in a dizzying, disconcerting, schizophrenic experience. The lyrics of the album are broad in themes, ranging from more comedic tones to dark and sexual references, often with the two becoming entwined and offering a sardonic take on their nature. One song could be about the discomfort in wearing earplugs while another reflects on domestic violence. Most interestingly, the record samples includes quotes from David Lynch's Blue Velvet, despite having a wildly different atmosphere. A Day of Nights is the first and only album by Battle of Mice, a supergroup comprised of sludge metal vocalist Julie Christmas, her partner at the time Josh Graham, and experimental rock band Book of Knots members. According to Julie, the album mirrors the progression of her dysfunctional relationship with Josh, which was unraveling at the time. Passages in each of the songs play like little snippets of nightmares, exhausting and disturbing and difficult to digest. Christmas's vocals are often polarizing, with whispered vocals contrasting with heavy crashing screaming. The second to last track, at the base of the giant's throat, includes a 911 call that was recorded during the incident where Julie was being beaten by her ex, allegedly, which she has yet to confirm or deny. 
Information Overload Unit is the debut album of SPK. The album deals with psychotic states and mental retardation and was recorded in a South London squat the Australian band had been staying in. The band had been inspired by Throbbing Gristle and Cabaret Voltaire. It also had conceptual and political themes, with the lyrics offering nods to Marxism and nihilistic philosophy and uncomfortable life performances, which, you guessed it, featured animal carcasses. The image on the cover shows a head being operated on, akin to the feelings that the album's hypnotic noisiness may induce on the listener. Coyle's last album, The Ape of Naples, was chief producer Peter Christopherson's effort in compiling 11 years worth of material after the death of lead vocalist John Balance in 2004. Christopherson used the process to deal with the grief of losing his longtime collaborator, describing a new ability to hear songs in new ways and attribute new meanings to Balance's lyrics. The haunting theme of the album resonates throughout, with Balance posthumously musing about the meaning of death with an eerily prescient tone. The sound is dark and hypnotizing, a combination of muffled and stretched electronics and acoustic instruments, and in particular, an interesting sounding marimba. While all of the residence's discography could be assessed and deconstructed to find unsettling and bizarre moments, Mark of the Mold introduces a conceptual narrative that transcends the music into something else entirely. The story follows the Moles, a subterranean society whose gods offer salvation through hard labor, and speculated to be a self-insert for the band, becoming forced to abandon the tunnels that they inhabited due to flooding. To survive, they must integrate with the Chubs, who live under the sea and are portrayed as a vapid, hedonistic culture, representing the commercial mainstream music world the band had been pressured to penetrate. They coexist successfully until the Chubs invent a machine that can do work for the others instead, which makes the Moles obsolete and sparks a war that is left sonically unresolved by the end of the album, with no clear winner and leading to the two ethnic groups to leap together in an uneasy peace. This satirical concept is also interpreted as a commentary on globalization at large, with darker, more orchestral offerings, simple but relentless dissonance, dark musical sarcasm, and a trademark cynical attitude. Hi How Are You is the sixth tape by Daniel Johnston, an outsider singer-songwriter whose career reflected a lifelong battle with bipolar disorder. It was self-released as a cassette, an unfinished album recorded by Johnston while he was in the midst of a nervous breakdown. It blends Johnston's signature chord organ and piano along with experiments in tape and noise collage, and some tentative guitar playing, and was given a widely distributed vinyl release in 1988. It was further popularized by Kurt Cobain, who wore a t-shirt with a cover art to a number of interviews in the early 90s. Like other of Johnston releases, it became a glimpse into his inner world, with plenty of soundtrack juxtapositions in lo-fi musings, which focused on cozy and comfortable pop songs. It reflects some of his most prolific and pure, childlike moments of his career, recorded in the basement of his parents' home in West Virginia with a trademark unpretentious sweetness. The collaboration album between ambient musician Robert Rich and sound design film score composer Lus Mort was inspired by Andrei Tarkovsky's 1979 film, Stalker. The film, which was in turn inspired by the book Roadside Picnic, is the story of a figure known as the Stalker, who takes clients to the mysterious zone, a room which grants them their innermost desires. The album blends the trademark disturbing noise of Lustmord with Rich's ethereal ambient, with the atmosphere alternating between deep cerebral meditation and a terrifying sense of dread. The horror of the unknown and the excitement of discovery are thrown together to create an experience unlike any other. Just like the one that awaits you in part two.